Commit your way to the Lord, and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. Trust in him, he will do this. My dad served in the National Guard in 1968 when Martin Luther King was assassinated. When I was about three months old, my dad became physically disabled and PTSD wasn't understood as well at that time. And we were all struggling as a result <laughs> because he was supposed to be the provider for us. And there was no money coming in. My mom had to figure out how to go back to work. And so dad stayed home with us. But again, he was physically present, but emotionally gone. Being the youngest of four, I was the baby of the family. And my parents weren't really around for me, so I wanted to hang out with my siblings, but they didn't really want me around. It was very lonely. And this is where I really started to see God in my life, but I didn't know it was God at the time. There was this presence in my life that wasn't a person, but it was, it was there. And it was basically my companionship throughout my childhood but I didn't know who or what that presence was. Fast forward years and years, my mom had heard about this math and science academy in Illinois, and it was a state-funded high school, and you'd apply like you were applying to college, and they would take students from all over the state. Also with that came people from all different religions, people who were atheists, people who were agnostic, people who were Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Wiccan, and my experience was often that the people who weren't Christian were the ones who were nicest to me. And the ones who said they were Christian oftentimes were more judgmental. And the atheists and the agnostics, there were many that spoke very negatively about the Bible. And it made me question like, who is God? And is God real? So now fast forward to college, I'm in a class called History of Architecture and Decor. We get to this part in this class and the teacher talks about Constantine's empire and all of the brutal killing of all these people. And this was Christianity. And I remember saying at that point in time, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. And in that moment, God spoke to me and said, but you wanna know the truth, right? I said, yes, I wanna know the truth. And he said, you are a Christian and I'm gonna show you. But at this point, I didn't want anything to do with God. I, I struggled with why wasn't God there fixing all the problems in life, if he was really real. <laughs> I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna try life on my own, the way the atheists and agnostics do. But when I made that choice to turn away from God, there was suddenly an emptiness. Go your own way. When I was at college, Around that time, I found out my parents had been getting involved with a church. And they were really, they're like, this church is teaching the Bible. And they started talking to me about Sabbath. The idea of not working on sundown Friday to sundown Saturday was completely incompatible with my life at the time. And the following spring, uh, my brother had returned a car to home to my parents' place, and I could have it now. When I got that car and brought it out to school, I was still struggling with whether I believed in God or not. And I remember saying, Lord, keep this car running until I can get it back home after graduation. So this whole thing with Sabbath happens with my mom. And she tells me to really study this out for myself and bring it to God and ask God if it's true or not. So I prayed, Lord, if this Sabbath thing is real, I need you to show me in a way that I will understand. You know that I can't believe something just because it's in a book and I can't believe something just because someone told me to believe it. I need to know from you that it's true. This car was a total rust bucket. I mean, it had a hole rusted into the trunk. I had to patch it with a piece of metal. It was rusting everywhere. And I just needed it to get me through my last bit of time at school. Every time I would take the car someplace on Friday night or Saturday that was not with keeping Sabbath, the car would flood out and leave me sit. Anytime on Friday night or Saturday that I was just going to a friend's place and hanging out for a bit, the car worked fine. The car had a bit of a gas smell. So I took it in and the guy comes out and is holding this. He says, ma'am, do you know what this is? I said, it's my gas tank, right? 
And he's like, yeah. You see this pipe right here? This was rusted off. Like there was no, it was not connected. He's like, I don't even know how your car was still running. Part of me knew beyond a doubt that God was real and that God was doing this. But another part of me was still like, this can't be real. It, which am I going to believe? Am I gonna believe what I know to be true or am I going to believe other ideas that are being taught to me? Because walking with one foot on each side of the fence isn't working. It was a struggle still to figure out which way to go. Fast forward the next semester, I'm learning what it is to be a Christian. My mom sent me and actually all my siblings a little box of books for Christmas. And when I read See With New Eyes by Ty Gibson, it was almost like a matrix moment in my life in how I understood the world to operate and function. How all the things that people had been teaching me about the Bible and about God's character that was negative, all of that was wrong. All of that was consistent with the character of Satan, not with the character of God. And I'd open up a scripture, I was reading Psalm 37, verse four, commit your way to the Lord and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. Trust in him and he will do this. And the tears just started flooding from my eyes. That was the promise that he made to me. And it was that same relationship, it was that same presence all through my life that had been leading me and guiding me. And hear that voice had spoken this scripture to me that I didn't even know was scripture at the time. I had never read it in God's word. And here it was, right in front of me. And at that point, I knew that this was God all along. He had his hand in my life from my earliest days. I just had to believe he was who he was. Oh, and then that, that red car, I got it home. And a month later, the transmission fell out of it. God kept it going until I got it home. The scene is the East Room of the White House. Two men are going to speak, and two men are going to become the focus of the nation's and also of international attention. The first is President William Jefferson Clinton. The second is Francis Collins, a geneticist physician. He's been leading the Human Genome Project, and they are here today to announce the completion of the mapping of the human genome. It's an incredible accomplishment worthy of attention around the world. Both men will speak, but it is what President Clinton had to say in one part of his speech that became the focus of much attention. Francis Collins tells about it in the open paragraphs and pages of his book, The Language of God. I want to read to you that brief part of the speech that became the focus of attention from President Clinton and then read to you some words from Francis Collins about that. Here are the president's words. Today, we are learning the language in which God created life. We are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, and the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. Well, that was a bit problematic for some. What was happening? Collins' words. What was going on here? Why would a president and a scientist charged with announcing a milestone in biology and medicine feel compelled to invoke a connection with God? Aren't the scientific and spiritual worldviews antithetical, or shouldn't they at least avoid appearing in the East Room together? What were the reasons for invoking God in these two speeches? Was this poetry, hypocrisy, <laughs> A cynical attempt to curry favor from believers or to disarm those who might criticize this study of the human genome as reducing humankind to machinery. No, not for me. Quite the contrary, for me the experiencing of sequencing the human genome and uncovering this most remarkable of all texts was both a stunning scientific achievement and an occasion of worship. Many will be puzzled by these sentiments, assuming that a rigorous scientist could not also be a serious believer in a transcendent God. This book aims to dispel that notion by arguing that belief in God can be an entirely rational choice and that the principles of faith are, in fact, complementary with the principles 
of science. What's going on? A scientist at the top of his game invoking God? A believer at the top of his game in the secular world of science? And then saying, you can have both. Well, it drives us to a question, a question that echoes from the pages of Shakespeare's works. It was Prince Hamlet who asked the question, contemplating the the, the difficulty and the darkness of life and the possibility of suicide. He asked the question, to be or not to be? That is the question. We pick up on echoes from Hamlet. And we change the topic to one that is just as critical. And this camp meeting series, we will ask it. To believe or not to believe? That is the question. So you have a friend. And that friend has looked at you incredulously and said, God? You believe in God? Seriously? And then comes the more piercing part of the question, just three letters long. Why? Now, you've had enough conversations with this friend to know his objections, her reservations about faith. You know what they'll say. You can't prove God to me. Furthermore, I don't need some heavenly being in the sky telling me how to live my life. After all, look at all the suffering in the world. And furthermore, if God does exist, why doesn't he talk to us now, not in some dusty old book on a forgotten shelf? And then comes the real nub of the issue. And look at organized religion, that that you belong to. Look at all the damage it has done throughout history and in the world. What about that? So those are the objections your friend raises. And those are the issues we're going to try to engage in the coming weeks. We're going to nibble around the edges and see if we can't find fruit. But as we begin, we first must state something about our hearts and our attitudes. Because people like me, religious people, have done untold damage to the cause of Christ by our arrogance, our smugness, and our condemnation too many times of the people around us. We've done great damage. So we have to first begin with the attitude of our hearts and souls, at least recognizing that had we walked in the footsteps, had we stood in the shoes, had we experienced the losses that some of the people who object have, we would likely be exactly where they are. It calls for humility and grace. In fact, I'm going to ask you if you would do something with me. I'd like to do it every single week of camp meeting, all five weeks. I'd like to adopt a verse as our North Star for guiding our conversations. It's a verse that appears in the first letter to Peter, chapter 3. So we're going to reach back into the history of Christian worship and reach over into the worship of some of our liturgical friends. And I'm going to ask if you would be willing to stand with me every week, one time, and read this verse together. You up to it? All right. Would you stand? We're going to put it up here on the screen. It's a text from 1 Peter chapter 3. And here we go. Let's read it aloud together. Worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live 
because you belong to Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I hope that you might with me be willing to adopt that as our North Star passage. Gentle, respectful, but keeping our conscience clear, meaning we do speak what's in our mind and heart. So your friend says, prove God to me. Prove it. And we take a breath, say a prayer, and speak the truth. I can't prove God to you. It's impossible to prove God. Furthermore, I can't even say I have utter certainty because the truth is the book we read does not ask for those two things. That is not that to which we are called. We sometimes still experience doubt. We sometimes still have questions. Your friend says, well, then what is your book asking? Our book is asking faith. In fact, I love, it's one of the most simple statements of Scripture about faith. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, listen to what it says. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. In other words, all those heroes of God, this is the kind of faith they experience. What's curious about it, it's confidence in what we hope for. In other words, there's a confidence within our being, and it's assurance about what we do not see. There's something outside of and above us that also assures us. So it's what's internally and what's externally that meets together and issues forth in this virtue called faith. You know the picture I get as I read Scripture about faith, this kind of faith? That it is a virtue that develops as we look at what available evidence we have. We thoughtfully approach it. We sort it through. We ask our questions. After all, does not something that is true deserve to have questions asked? We ask our questions, we sort through the evidence, and by the time we're done, we then make a choice to say, this is that in which I place my faith. Prove God to me, says your friend. I can't prove God, but I can talk to you about why I have faith. So let's begin with one reason, one reason for belief. I go to Psalm, the book of Psalm, the ancient hymn book of Israel, chapter 19. You can almost picture David, maybe as a youth, out on the mountainsides in the Judean wilderness, vast and open and silent, being there at night and taking in the immensity of space. And that sometime after that experience, he sits down and scratches out these words that we now read. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Do you see what David is saying? The heavens proclaim, the skies display, the voiceless voice speaks, the wordless message has gone out. All about God. Are these just the poetic ponderings, the mystical musings of a pre scientific shepherd poet? Or is there something here? I have to be honest with you and tell you that I've been thinking about and praying about our time together in this first Sabbath for many months. Because I want to talk to you about something that I know nothing about. 
I am not a scientist nor the son of one. And so I have spent months reading, reading, taking in, trying to understand, asking questions, trying to open my mind. I have been awed and stunned and struck dumb with questions at times, sorting through this reality about which Francis Collins spoke when he said, there are credible reasons for belief, even as a rigorous scientist. So out of the time I've spent, I've chosen only one, just one reason which to me is profoundly credible. There are so many more. I'll tell you one other thing I've learned in my many hours of reading, and that is that I have barely scratched the surface of this topic. So, what I present to you today is what is often spoken of as the argument of fine-tuning. The argument of fine-tuning. Here's what it says very simply. It says that the universe, not the planet, but the universe is so finely, so precisely tuned that to change it even in the most simple of ways would not ever have allowed the universe to exist or would bring it to an end right now, including us on planet Earth. Furthermore, that the fine-tuned realities of the universe are such that allow for life on this planet called Earth. That we who sit here today are able to be here today, are able to be alive today, to think about this, to ask these questions, because the entire universe is so finely tuned. So let me read you the words of one author who gathers together some of the different themes and topics and questions and answers, puts them onto paper. He writes this, What is especially remarkable about the fine-tuning argument is that the more time passes, the stronger it gets because science discovers more and more examples of it. So it is one thing to say, as the scientist Carl Sagan did, that there are two parameters necessary for life, and Earth just happens to meet both of them. It would be the same if there were five necessary parameters or ten. We might still be able to see Earth having met these parameters as a matter of simple good luck. But as the decades have passed and science has uncovered scores and scores and then hundreds of examples of such perfect fine-tuning, the odds become far too astronomical to dismiss as luck or coincidence. The overwhelming impression is that the burgeoning welter of perfect coincidences has mounted to a level impossibly beyond anything we can put down to coincidence so that even the most hostile atheists must at least wonder whether it is all precisely as it is, precisely because it was intentionally designed to be that way. Fine-tuning. Paul Davies, Arizona State University, physicist, agnostic in matters of God, talks about the perfect fine-tuning of the four fundamental forces that hold the universe together. The gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. Perfectly fine-tuned, says Davies, to keep the universe intact and to allow for life to exist on our planet. As he talks about those, I want you to listen to what he says. Again, he's not pushing God. He's agnostic on this. But listen to Davies' words. It is hard, he writes, to resist the impression, it's hard to resist the impression that the present structure of the universe, apparently so sensitive to minor alterations in the numbers, has been carefully thought out. So what he's saying is, has it been carefully thought out? When I look at the numbers, it's hard to resist that impression. 
the seemingly miraculous concurrence of numerical values that nature has assigned to her fundamental constants must remain the most compelling evidence for an element of cosmic design. So if I could use my own words to try to capture his, it appears that he's saying, when I look at the numbers, when I look at the realities, the four fundamental forces, they're fine-tuning. I have to tell you, it's hard to resist the impression of some kind of design in this. And then about right about there, it gets truly stunning. The astrophysicist Hugh Ross, in writing about the balance between the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force, says this, at certain early epochs in cosmic history, the universe's mass density must have been as finely tuned as one part in 10 to the 60th power. Now, we're going to come back in a moment to talk about the size of one part in 10 to the 40th power. It's a number that you can't grasp. Must have been as finely tuned as one part in 10 to the 60th power to allow for the possible existence of physical life at any time or place within the entirety of the universe. This degree of fine-tuning is so great that it's as if Right after the universe beginning, someone could have destroyed the possibility of life within it by subtracting a single dime's mass from the whole of the observable universe or adding a single dime's mass to it. Just let that sit there. A dime. You know the size of a dime. So what Davies is saying is, if that amount of mass had been added or taken away, could very well have destroyed the possibility of life anywhere in the universe. And then Ross uses an illustration, which helped me with my non-scientific mind. He said, imagine the continental contiguous United States you got that picture in mind? Now get quarters to cover the entire continental contiguous United States. And we like Canada, so let's add them in. We now cover all of Canada with quarters. And oh, there's another state, Alaska. Let's cover all of Alaska with quarters. And we love our neighbors to the south, so let's cover all of Mexico with quarters and halfway into Central America, all covered with quarters. Numbers start to bend your mind. Then he says, keep adding quarters, keep piling them up until in that entire area of this continent, quarters are piled up high enough to cover Mount McKinley, some 20,000 plus feet high. Quarters over the entire area. And now, multiply that by 12. Now the quarters are up to 240,000 feet. And then multiply that by 50. Now they're 240,000 miles out, bumping into the moon. But no, don't worry, nobody lives there. That's the height of the quarters. Pardon me, the dimes. I'm growing here, inflation. <laughs> of the dimes. And then do one other thing. Now do the same exact thing on one billion other continents. One billion. And when you're done, tell a friend, somewhere in there is a red dime. Find it. Extract it. And everything is over. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Are those just the poetic ponderings? The mystical musings 
of a pre-scientific shepherd poet. It's mind-numbing. So there are four men. They're called the New Atheists who have spoken and written prolifically about the damage that they believe religion has caused to the world. And friends, don't get your back up because they have some valid points. We'll talk about that later on. It's time we own where our faith has gone wrong and seek to reflect the love of Jesus. So the four atheists, the new atheism it's called, Christopher Histon, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and and, uh, Dennis... uh, The other one slips in my mind. The new atheist. Very outspoken at times, very aggressive, and at times very angry. So they've gone back and forth, back and forth with with people of faith. At times in angry, angry, volatile discussions. At other times in, in more thoughtful ways. So somebody asked Christopher Hitchens, put a camera on his face, and asked him a question. Some have surmised later that that maybe it was an unguarded moment for Hitchens. By the way, after first service, one of you scientists told me the same thing has now happened with Richard Dawkins. But in this case, Hitchens. Camera on him and asked him, okay, you've gone through all of this. You've written, you've, you've debated, you believe. So tell me, what is the most convincing argument from the other side? In other words, when you're contesting whether or not there's a God, what does the other side say that maybe gives you a little bit of pause? I want to read you Hitchens' words. Here's how he answered. It is the fine-tuned argument, the fine-tuning, that one degree, well, one degree, one hair of difference, and his voice trailed off. Even though it doesn't prove design, doesn't prove a designer, you have to spend time thinking about it, working on it. It's not a trivial argument. We all say that. When he says we all say that, he's referring to himself and his four colleagues. The fact that one small infinitesimal change in the universe could have prevented life. That, he said, that's the one with which we struggle. So as I've been reading, as I've been thinking about this, thinking about dimes, not quarters, dimes, it's almost impossible to do so without wondering, where do we fit in? In the vast panoply of the sky, Where are we? This place where there actually is life. So I want to use an illustration. It's not perfect. Just go with me. But it was helpful to me. Maybe it will be to you. So I want you to imagine that we we get in the space shuttle and we travel back. We travel back, back, back as far away as we can from the universe as it is now known. I, I realize, not possible, but just hang with me. We get so far back that the universe is spread out before us and we take a picture. And then we come back to Earth. We go down to Costco. We take our little disc. We say, we got a picture on here. Wonder if you could print it. And they say, yeah, we'll do that for you. Well, we got a special request. We would like you to print it on a piece of photographic paper the size of the United States. So we would like to roll it out from the lapping shores of Santa Monica all the way to Hudson Bay on the east. We want to roll it out from the northernmost parts of North Dakota border with Canada all the way down to the humid valleys of Texas. The entire country covered by this picture. They gulp, recover, and say, we'll do it. It's going to cost you a quarter. (laughs) It's going to cost you, but we'll do it. And so they do, and the day comes when they're done, and it's rolled out. As we look at what's beneath our feet, galaxies and stars and suns and worlds and space, a lot of space, we can't help but ask, where are we? Where do we fit? 
And so we get an astronomer, world-class astronomer. Can you show us where we are? I'll do it. It's going to take a while. It spends a few days, a few weeks, until finally he has it sorted out, says, come on, get in the car, and we begin to drive. And the universe is flashing by on both sides of the car. We drive and drive until finally we stop. He surveys the area. He gets out of the car, walks, paces off, continues to survey two or three hours until finally he stops, stops right there, center, right outside Dallas, Texas. (laughs) He stops there. And he says, everybody gather around. So we gather around. He gets down on his knees. He says, come in. I want you to see. When we're all in, he points to a little dot. He points to a piece of lint on the face of the universe. He says, you see that dot? The size of a pencil lead? That's our sun. Our world doesn't appear. It's too small. Fine-tuned. The universe. That life exists there. The astronomer, mathematician, physicist, Michael Gillen, talks about these things and talks about the period of time in our history when we were searching for, for, for life outside of this planet. He said for a period of time it was thought that there, there, w- there must be a lot of life out there. If there's only two conditions necessary for life to exist, there must be a great deal of it. But in the decades as the search has gone on, all we've heard is crickets. Gillen writes about this. He says, in a paper submitted to the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, the authors concluded, we find a substantial probability that we are alone in our galaxy and perhaps even in our observable universe. If any little green men, says Gillen, do exist out there somewhere, the authors add, they're somewhere over the rainbow, quite possibly beyond the cosmological horizon and forever unreachable. Remarkably, says Gillen, the Bible agrees. It tells us that sentient beings do exist beyond the cosmological horizon. One of them in particular visited Earth 2,000 years ago, and his stay is documented in striking detail in the most widely read book in human history. An ancient tome that has survived centuries of scrutiny by countless skeptics and is today supported by volumes of well-documented historical and physical evidence. A book that squarely takes on the question, are we alone, and gives us the definitive answer, no, we are not. So your friend asks, God... You believe in God? Seriously? Prove it to me. And you take a breath and say a prayer and remember our guiding North Star passage. And you humbly say, I can't prove it to you. I even have doubts at times. But I can tell you this. I have looked at every piece of evidence that I can find and have found so much of it to be credible. And then, as I have wrestled with evidence that is credible, I've also listened to the poetic ponderings, the musical musings, of an ancient shepherd poet. And at the end of all that, I've made a choice and I have placed my faith in God. And then, 
Maybe you should add this. Maybe you should say to your friend, could I ask you a favor? Can I borrow a dime? <laughs> Gracious God, no wonder the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies reveal the work of his hands. Lord, you've created us with minds to think, to ask, and to choose. Lord, thank you. And receive us as we place our faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.